Dave would crush that. Very, very good. So that song was actually written by a guy named Pete Seeger in the 50s. Didn't become popular until the Birds uh, released it in 1965. It spent three weeks on top of the Billboard 100 charts, right? And if, uh, if you're, how many of you remember that from back in the day? You lived through that? All right, look, look around, kids. Those are the druggies here from the 1960s. All right, the druggies. They're the flower children, the hippies. All right, so what was going on in that, that time? There was a lot of experimentation going on. It was like these weird mantras, like free love, free sex, free drugs. Weird time. I'm not saying all these people rose their hand and went through all that. But, but there was a lot of cultural unrest going on, people trying different things. And they could probably identify with the teacher here in Ecclesiastes 3 who had all the pleasures in the world, trying to experience, experiment, experience everything. And you know what they found? People in the 60s found, just like Solomon found, is emptiness. Emptiness. Without God, there, there's nothing of substance. And the first thing we see as we turn to this text is that we just see time is in God's hands. If we look at Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, it reads, There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And if I skip a little bit ahead, I, I could show you that God, it says God made everything beautiful in his time. So it's talking about how God is the one orchestrating all these events in time. He's organizing time. But all we can do on our own is kind of measure it. And, and often we just see time happening to us, right? Uh, Vince Lombardi, famous football coach, uh, had a great quote. He said, I've never lost a game. I've just run out of time. All right? Some of you can identify with that. I had the honor of officiating a wedding for one of a great couple, some great friends of mine that were students of mine in Louisville, Kentucky area, and uh, this was this past Sunday, so I, it's been a full year that I've been down here. They're asking me questions about Florida, like, you know, kind of like it's a foreign country, like, what's it like down there, and, you know, I, I you know, I told them there's one of the big differences culturally is, of course, you've got two sets of time, right? You've got... You know, kind of your normal time. You got people that are working hard to make ends meet. You got high cost of living, all that. And then you got the other people who are on retired time, right? <laughs> so sometimes you run into those people and you wait in line or on, you know, at traffic lights and all those type of things. So we got these two competing parts of time. But the thing is, every one of us, regardless of how we treat time, we all have 24 hours in each day and we, we make the most of it what, what we can. So the teacher here comes to the idea of time, and he's saying, you know what? I've, time is vanity. He says it's meaningless. Uh, I'm going to pick up in verse 2. He reads, it's a time to be born. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build. There's a time to weep. And a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Verse 9 says, what will workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet, no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink, find satisfaction in all, all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away. God does it so that people will fear him. And whatever has already been, whatever is has already been, whatever will be has been before, and God will call the past to an account. So as you're reading this, I kind of feel like that the soft, easygoing, melodic tune of that bird song is probably not exactly how... The teacher was saying this, right? He was uh, a little frustrated because he's, you know, it, going on this theme of vanity. Everything is meaningless. I've come up empty. Um, I, I would say, like, in a modern-day vernacular here in honor of Father's Day, I came up with my own 
list, trying to go in, in, in the same vein as the teacher. So this is for dads here. There's a time for steak, and there's a time for peanut butter sandwiches. There's a time to mow the grass, and there's a time to take a nap. There's a time for gas tanks to be full, and there's a time where you can barely afford to fill them up. There's a time for buying diapers, and then there's a time for trying to afford groceries to feed the teenagers. There's a time to earn salary, and there's a time to watch your earnings tank in the market. There, there's a time to have fun with your kids, and there's a time where they're too cool to have fun with you anymore. There's a time to get frustrated by your kids asking, why, why, why? And there's another time where they pretend they already know everything and don't ask you anything. Happy Father's Day. Life is vanity. All right, guys. Happy Father's Day. Okay. Okay. So how do we view time here? Uh, there's, there's different uh, approaches we could have. You know, your standard, you could have your standard timeline. So, you know, oh, 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 we got, we need to fix this here. All right. So we got a standard timeline, which is linear. There's a starting point. Let's say you're born here, and then you, you keep living your life. You know, maybe right here you uh, graduate high school. Here you get married. If you're, you know, if you're real blessed like the Bronze, they celebrated 55 years of, of marriage this week. Yeah. And in first, first service, I learned that uh, the Ashby's, they've been married 67 years. We've got some awesome couples in this church. Yeah. So... So some people, you know, are blessed with a lot of time together, but the, the reality is all of us, there's going to be an end point here at some point at the end of our lives. Some, some is a lot longer away than others, but that's how time works. Now, when we look at the, what the teacher's saying about time, uh, the, uh, the idea was popularized by an anti-God philosopher named Frederick Nietzsche who, who said time is a flat circle. And he got this idea, his idea is, Largely from, from Solomon here saying, okay, if we lived for an eternity, we'd keep making the same mistakes over and over again, you know? You remember when I kind of feel like that's how time is like? Things just happen again and again and again. We keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Well, that's one way of looking at it. I think that's kind of a, a way that which Solomon would, would have looked at it. But there's another way. One of my favorite college professors uh, at Johnson Bible College named Dr. David Reese, he was an Old Testament professor, and he talked about how we can look through the lens of the Old Testament, not just linear like a standard timeline, but also circular. So the same kind of things happen over and over again. We see uh, the same mistakes being made, the same victories being won over and over again as time progresses. So, so an example, God's people, the Israelites, when they were captives, they were slaves in Egypt, and then God did some wondrous, amazing things. They trusted him. They, they, they put blood, the blood of the lamb on their door frames. God led them out, did miracles, parted the seas, and wonderful things happened. And then what happened? They melted down all their jewelry and made an idol, right? And things got bad. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they come back and they, they, they enter the promised land. Things are good, you know? And then guess what happens? Same mistakes over and over again. They want a king, and they, sometimes they get a good king, and sometimes they get a terrible king, and the same mistakes come over and over again. Each generation making their own mistakes, often learning from them, and, and sometimes learning the hard way brings repentance, coming back to Scripture, seeing the air of their ways, turning to God, and followed by good times, right? Now, uh, secular culture today, if you're, if you're online a lot, you may see like a, there's a popular meme talks about how hard times make strong men. Has anybody seen this one? Hard times make strong men. And strong men make good times, and good times make weak men, and then weak men make, what, hard times. They start over again. It's the same cycle all over again. I don't know. If, if, if that, I feel like that's kind of parallel in some ways to Scripture, and if that's the case, like, oh, what are we in for here? Uh-oh, hard times. You can kind of feel it. Uh, hard times times. Things happen over and over again. When do we learn from our mistakes? Today is not only Father's Day, today is Juneteenth, which celebrates the end of slavery in America, finally two years after the, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. 
news made it all the way to the south in Texas that the slaves were free. Uh, we celebrate this day, and it's wonderful. Uh, and are, are glad all the different milestones that have happened since then. But at the same time, we should also recognize the oppression still going on in the world, right? There are millions of people in human trafficking in America and around the world globally. Sex trafficking trade is still rampant. There's forced labor camps happening in many communist countries around the world. People are still oppressed. We keep seeing some of the same mistakes uh, humanity made, and sometimes we turn a blind eye to these same atrocities. When will we learn? When will we learn? When will we grow? Well, we could look at time from a micro lens, being like, okay, we got this one moment. Here's this one moment. We're all together here in this room uh, today. You could have spent your day doing something else, but you're here. Or we could look at it as a zoomed out lens, the macro lens where we say, okay, this is one moment of each of our lives where we're getting closer to death, closer to our ultimate end. Now, part of the issue we have dealing with time is that we just are reactive to it, right? So much of what we deal with is just stuff that's out of our control, right? None of us here control the economics, directly slow down. It's just happening to us right now, right? Uh, None of us uh, have, you know, are directly responsible for some of the uh, crime and problems going on, but it's happening to us. It's happening to our country, okay? It's like a ticking clock. Sometimes we feel like we have fleeting resources. We don't feel like anything is right, and we can identify with Solomon in that things are not right. It feels vain. It feels meaningless, we can, we can try. We can do our best, right? We can wear our seat belts. We can, you can buy organic, um, you know, groceries and try and live better and try and live uh, healthy. You can buy in insurance. You can invest in your 401k. You can do all the things to prepare yourself to, to try and, and make your circumstances the best as possible. But in reality, there's only so much you can control, right? You've got, we've got to have the words of David in Psalm 31 on our hearts, it says, my time is in your hands, O Lord. That's a good way to live. My time is in your hands. Our, our objective should be that no matter what season we find ourselves in, we should live to enjoy it. Yeah, we could, should look and see God in this season, see the goodness of God, how he's working. Now, some of you may be like in a really terrible season, and it's just hard to see God in this. But when we do, when we find those glimmers of his hope that can really, really change our perspective. Uh, when it's too often, though, we get stuck either reminiscing, thinking about things in the past, or we get stuck thinking about when life is going to be better in the future. When I just get to this point, when I just have enough money or resources for this, or when I just have enough time for this, life will be better. And when we do that, when we live in the past or live in the future, we miss the present. Parents can be guilty of this. I know dads, if, if you're like me, I've had uh, kids in diapers here for, oh, it's been way too long, 60 years. I just keep thinking, when can I, can I get them out of diapers, right? I give them potty trains and things will be better. And then, you know, I start thinking, well, maybe it'll be nice too once they get in school, once they all get in school, get on a routine, it'll be nice too for us and things will be a little more organized. And, and you can just keep going on. You could wish different seasons of life away, but I keep the, the beauty of being at a multi-generational church like this, I keep getting reminded by many of you who, who those days have gone by, like, oh, it goes fast. Don't miss it, right? It goes so fast, and every moment is worth living in right in the present and enjoying it the, for what it's worth. Not only parents uh, can, can do that and have that view of time, but I think sometimes students can have that view of time, right? So you're like, oh, I can't wait till summer's here, then my life is going to be so much better, right? Or you get a little older and you think, I just can't wait until I get a license. Someday I'm going to have some more freedom and drive around where I want and go where I want. I'm going to go to McDonald's, right? <laughs> and, and you think, well, once I get to college, things are going to be good. I'll be on my own. I'll have to listen to mom and dad's rules. And then you get off to college. And then what happens? And you think, oh, wait, actually, maybe it wasn't so bad at home, was it? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. So we get, we get stuck thinking about the future or the past and miss the present. This past week, I had an awesome week. 
uh, spent some time with some middle schoolers at Christ and Youth Mix Camp. Uh, we were, went up to Lakeland, Florida together. This was a, a picture from when we had front row seats for our worship night. It was awesome. We, had, we just had a great time. In, in fact, we've got uh, some, some of these students have made decisions. We're going to get a witness in baptisms here today from this camp and from Lake Aurora, too. So I'm really excited about that here. Um, but so at the last session, we had a good small group time where we uh, opened up scriptures together and talked about our, our time together. And, and one of the students pulled me aside and said, I cannot wait for next year. And I knew for me that was like a huge win, right? I just love that they want to come back. I'm excited. But at the same token, you know, sometimes that kind of means like, I, I can't wait. I want to live spiritually for next camp, right? And the next camp is when I can have this next spiritual experience, right? But the danger of us is like, we, we don't want to just live looking forward to next year. We've got to take this, take what we've learned, take the worship times and the, the times hanging out together with friends and bring this back and live this through the year, right? We, we can build this and we can, we can grow and make our youth ministry something uh, that is impactful each and every week throughout the, throughout the year. We don't want to just live from one season to the next. We want to live today. So we have the, have the attitude of Psalm 31. My time is in your hands, O Lord. And so, and when we get to verse 12, Solomon writes, I know there's nothing better for people uh, to be, there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. One of the things when we, when we realize uh, that t about time comes around again is that it helps us understand we don't want to miss it, right? You will not get this season of life that you're in again, right? It only comes around once. Uh, so what should we do? We do good. We serve God in each season knowing that there will be opportunities here that we'll never see again. This season you're in won't come again. So we've got to make the most. We've got to seize the day. One of the uh, greatest films of all time, in my opinion, is a film with Robin Williams, The Dead Poet Society, where he challenges young people uh, to look to the past and look for examples of how, how we can make the most of each moment. So check out this clip. Now, Mr. Pitt. That's a very unfortunate name. Mr. Pitt. Where are you? Mr. Pitt's Open hymnal, page 542. Read the first stanza of the poem you find there. Two of the versions to make much of time? Yes. One. <laughs> Somewhat appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That's to seize the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No. Ding. Thank you for playing anyway. Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. Mm. I'd like you to step forward over here and peruse some of the faces from the past. You've walked past them many times. I don't think you've really looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Haircut, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait till it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. If you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it?
Carpe Diem. Seize. Seize the day. All right. And with Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, he says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Make the most of every opportunity and be very careful. Now, one of the dangers uh, that Christians have, have stepped into over the, over the years when it talks about being very careful, some Christians are careful in the wrong way, like a defensive carefulness, like, you know, I want to just put a big bubble suit on and be very careful, right? And it's not what, what he's talking about. He's being very careful to make the most of every opportunity, very careful to keep your eyes open, keep looking out for what the things God is orchestrating, God is in control, and God is giving you opportunities to, to speak for him, to, to grow the kingdom, uh, to encourage one another, to build one another up. But sometimes, though, how, we just we don't feel it. We feel more like the words of Solomon when he's saying, time is is vanity. How do, how can I live? I just things are careening out of control. That I just there's so much anxiety going on. There's so many reasons to be discouraged by things that are out of our control. How do we know though that God is actually orchestrating these? Well, C.S. Lewis says the famous quote: "If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world." If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, it does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only arouse it to suggest the real thing. Lewis would go on to uh, describe how uh, the sense of longing, the sense uh, that we have inside of us, is kind of like the scent of a flower that we have not yet found. It's like the echo of a tune we haven't yet heard. It's like news from a country we haven't visited. This is the eternity the Lord has put in our hearts. So how do, how do we know? How, we, we don't look to our own circumstances. Sometimes those circumstances are the fog that gets in our way. We look to Jesus because at just the right time, just the right time, as God is orchestrating time, he sent Jesus. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, says this directly, but when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law. Just the right time. You think about that 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and then till Jesus comes. That 400 years of waiting and wandering. We're like, well, is there hope? Where, uh, where is the hope? And at just the right time, God sent Jesus. At just the right time, after three days of uh, darkness after three days of questioning this this happened after after Jesus had been abused he'd been betrayed by his friends and after three days of wondering was there any hope at just the right moment Christ defeated sin and death at just the right time so there's different takeaways we could have uh, when we talk about how our view of time is you know one of them of course, is that carpe diem. We've got to seize. They make the most of every opportunity. Be careful to look out. That is, that is a good biblical takeaway I hope you have today. You know, another one is the idea of like just squeezing uh, the most out of our time, right? Every, uh, every opportunity, we want to, we want to make, live our lives to the full, John 10, 10. Those are good. But the biggest point when we see Ecclesiastes chapter 3 uh, is this. When we look when we put on the lens of the teacher, the only way for us to escape the vanity, the meaningless of life, is not to look to one who sits under the sun, but one who is enthroned above it, right? God escapes the timeline. God is eternal. In fact, he created, he created, he set the sun to rise and set in, in the beginning. He's the one who started time. But God escapes the timeline, and we serve a God who sits enthroned above it all. So we can, uh, we can think about ourselves, we can think about our temporary problems, but if our lives aren't set on the one who is eternal, then life is just going to come up meaningless. Life is going to come up 
empty. The best way to seize the day, the best way to make each, most of each moment is for us to center our lives on the one who is above it all, above eternity, our Father. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of time. Uh, a lot of us in here, we could, we could reminisce and think about good, good things that we've seen you orchestrate in our past, good uh, people that have, have taught us uh, your word, good relationships that have encouraged us and equipped us. Thank you for those. Lord, help us not to, be, to live in the past. Help us uh, not to live in the future and just longing for a future anyways. Help us to live right now, right today, knowing you are the eternal one in every moment you are ordained and you've given us uh, gifts. Help us to live right now for you. Father, we thank you for Jesus, and we pray this all in his name. Amen. All right, tonight, uh, for, for this next moment, we're going to have a communion time together. And when we take communion, it all the foundation of it all is remembering Jesus, remembering. So we're looking back to the past. Remember what he did for us. He sacrificed his life for us on the cross. He, he bled and died for us. He rose from the dead. We remember him. But also in doing that, it, it causes us to reflect on the present. It just, it's just naturally what happens. Think about uh, what's going on in your life, how you can center your life more on Jesus, and then anticipate the future. Anticipate the goodness uh, of God when one day God is going to make all things right and every knee will bow and every time we'll confess to Jesus, Lord. So we, we're going to take this time uh, together. If you haven't grabbed communion, you're welcome to uh, go, go bring some back to your chair. Whenever you're ready, remember Jesus, reflect on him, and anticipate what he's going to do.